The basic concept of cells is, I'll remind you of something called the cell theory, which probably you've all heard of from lecture, even from me. The cell theory is this concept that all life, at least here on the planet Earth, uh, is made up of cells. And presumably, even life, if it exists elsewhere, would also be made up of cells. Uh, this was uh, proposed in the, uh, 1858 by a number of biologists. Uh, and we mentioned them. Uh, the, uh, they were Schleid and Schwann and Burkhoff. You don't have to know those names. You don't have to know the dates. And uh, basically, Schleiden was a botanist, and every plant that he examined with a magnifying lens, he said they were made up of cells. And if you looked at that leaf of the plant last week, you saw those rectangular cells. Uh, if you looked at the onion, you saw cells. Maybe. You should have. But uh, 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 the, uh, Theodore Schwann was a zoologist. Zoologists study animals. Every animal that he examined with a magnifying lens, he said every part of it was made up of cells. Rudolf Rakoff was a pathologist, a medical doctor. Every part of the human body he looked at, he found it was made up of cells. If you were successful in looking at your cheek, uh, and if you weren't, we'll give you an opportunity to do it again today, and I'll try to set it up on demo, but if you were successful in looking at your cheek, you saw these little cheek cells. So, uh, and you'd see blood cells, and you'd see uh, muscle cells and brain cells. So uh, the cell theory basically says all things are made up of one or more cells, and all cells give rise to other cells. So the cell is the basic unit of life that has the capacity to live, to uh, produce energy, to grow, to reproduce and respond to their environment. These are known as the characteristics of living things. And if you have me for lecture, we've certainly covered the characteristics of living things in my lecture outline is page A3. But uh, so uh, anything smaller than a cell is not considered alive, and it doesn't exhibit these characteristics of life. Anything that's bigger than a single cell, like us, is simply made up of lots of cells. And one of the most extraordinary things I can remind you of is no matter how big a living organism is, whether it's the size of us or even a whale, every living thing begins life as a single microscopic cell. You began as a single microscopic fertilized egg or zygote. So all life begins at a single cell. Now, cells we wrote in the third paragraph vary a great deal in size and uh, shape. And uh, when we uh, uh, look at uh, cells, they, we can divide them into two broad ca uh, categories, prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. Now, the root karyo, K-E-R-Y-O, means nucleus. So prokaryotic cells, as we wrote, lack a nucleus. They don't have a nucleus. These are usually very small cells. They lack a nucleus, and they really lack most other internal organelles. The other broad category are eukaryotic cells. The prefix EU, U, means true. They have a true nucleus, and they usually are much larger cells that have this st structure in the center called a nucleus and many other internal structures called organelles or little organs. Now, uh, the nucleus is called the nucleus because the word nucleus means in the center. So just as there's the, we call the area in the center of an atom, a nucleus of an atom, we call this structure more or less in the center of a cell, the nucleus of the cell. In this picture, it shows how cells vary in size. This is a single-celled organism that lives in pond water called an amoeba. And uh, here is the human egg. Here is a human cheek cell that some of you may have successfully looked at last week, or we'll see it this week. And a bacterium is barely visible. It's, it's about, a bacterium is about 1 one-hundredth the size of a human cheek cell. Uh, and that's, a bacterium is the smallest all, of all living cells. And a bacterium is a prokaryotic cell. It doesn't have a nucleus. It's a very small cell, lacking most internal organelles. Incidentally, drawn right here in the background is the thickness of a typical human hair. So just in terms of relative size, you can see that a cheek cell is just a fraction of the th uh, size of the thickness of a typical hair. So a hair is actually thicker uh, about maybe twice or three times the bigger in size than a single microscopic cell. Let's uh, uh, look d uh, briefly at a prokaryotic cell, such as a bacterium. It's written there. Just read it. Yeah, you'll read it. 
It, we just covered it. Okay, so uh, the, uh, uh, this is what a bacterium looks like, enlarged, which was pictured right here, uh, enlarged. And uh, again, it's called a prokaryotic cell. Listen to this, because it doesn't have a nucleus. That's literally what it means, without a nucleus, and it's written there. The very small cells without a nucleus and most other internal organelles. Now, uh, this uh, bacterial cell or prokaryotic cell has a cell membrane or plasma membrane. It's written right here. And surrounding the uh, cell membrane, it has an outer wall. Now, this outer cell wall is always made up of a polysaccharide. Now, if you've had lecture and covered polysaccharides, you should already know what that is. If you have me for a lecture, and, you have, and we haven't learned about it yet, but we will, I promise you. Polysaccharide literally means, does anybody know what poly means? Many. Many. And saccharide? Sugar. So it's really a complex sugar. It's a complex carbohydrate. That's what makes up the chemical composition of the cell wall. In case anybody's wondering, are you expecting us to know this? 100% yes. All right? Now, um, the, uh, in addition uh, to the uh, outer cell wall, there's this jelly-like fluid on the inside of the bacterial cell called cytoplasm or protoplasm. Cytoplasm is always, in every cell, about 80% water. And after water, the next major chemical that makes up cytoplasm are proteins. So the cytoplasm is kind of this jelly-like fluid that's basically mostly made up of water and proteins by weight. Of course, there's all kinds of other chemicals in the cytoplasm, including sugars and uh, fatty acids and vitamins and minerals and everything else. But it's mostly water and protein by weight. Uh, now, what is shown right here is not a nucleus. This is actually a piece of DNA. Uh, we'll call it a chromosome, but a chromosome is actually made up of the chemical called DNA. In bacterial cells, which is what we're looking at, this piece of DNA, or a chromosome, is shaped like a ring, like a circle, like a circle. And so that's not a nucleus. It's simply a circular piece of DNA, or chromosome. That's what they look like in bacterial cells. Okay, so if that's, that's a, a, an example of a prokaryotic cell, we will be looking at bacteria, not today, but in a few weeks. We will be looking at bacteria under the microscope. On the next page, so now that we've talked about a prokaryotic cell, let's consider eukaryotic cells. What did we say the root EU means? U. True. What does karyo mean? Nucleus. So if you understand what roots mean, that helps you remember what the words mean. So true nucleus. Now, uh, an example of cells that have a nucleus that are much larger cells with an internal nucleus in the center and many other internal organelles are both animal cells, pictured on the left, and plant cells, pictured on the right. Incidentally, we actually have models of this. Uh, this is uh, an animal, typical animal cell, like you see right here. And right here, this is a typical plant cell. So if you're a kinesthetic learner, meaning somebody who likes to learn better by touching and feeling, then you can touch and feel these things uh, to understand them better besides just looking at a picture. Uh, but anyhow, so uh, let's see what uh, a typical animal cell, and this looks a lot like the cheek cells that you would have looked at, uh, and this, uh, what a typical plant cell, and this looks kind of like what the Elodea uh, leaf cells look like. So let's see what they have in common to each other and how they differ from one another. All right, so both uh, animal cells and plant cells have a cell membrane. Both of them have this jelly-like fluid called cytoplasm inside. Cytoplasm in these cells, just like in the bacterial cell, is 80% water, and after that, proteins. Uh, in addition, uh, here, of course, why they're called eukaryotic cells, is they have this large structure in the center called a nucleus. What does the word nucleus mean? In the center. Uh, inside the nucleus is uh, a, an area called the nucleolus, or nucleolus. And uh, we're going to be learning that the nucleus uh, contains jelly-like fluid and also contains DNA, or chromosomes. But where the nucleolus is, is where there's a high amount of RNA. Now, you might say, you know, Professor Fink, you're saying this way too fast, faster than I can copy it down. 
It's all written right below. Right? So, in fact, we wrote uh, the nucleus contains more than one chromosome made up of DNA. The nucleolus, we wrote that the nucleus contains one or more nucleoli. Uh, the nucleolus stores RNA. So there's RNA in the nucleolus, which is a chemical needed for the production of proteins within the cell. Anyhow, uh, what else is uh, uh, in both animal cells and plant cells? There are various vacuoles. What's a vacuole? A vacuole, I wrote, is a sac. It's a little storage sac. And so uh, both animal cells and plant cells can have many of these vacuoles or sacs. And one more structure that both animal cells and plant cells possess, and that's something called a mitochondria. Now, mitochondria, and we wrote about it down below, mitochondria are organelles, little structures, where sugars are broken down for energy. And in fact, they're commonly nicknamed the powerhouses of the cell because they produce this special type of chemical that is used for energy and this chemical is called, anybody know? ATP. So that's where most of the ATP is produced in a cell, is in the mitochondria. If you haven't yet talked about my AT ATP in your lecture class yet, I promise you, when you do, yeah, once they begin, they will keep saying ATP every single class meeting. All right? That's the gasoline that's produced in the mitochondria that powers cells. So uh, that's what's going on. Uh, now, uh, if those things that we've just mentioned are what animal and plant cells have in common, we might ask, okay, so how are they different from one another? <clears throat> All right, so the main differences, and I'm going to primarily focus on the plant cell, we're right here, on the far right-hand side. <clears throat> Only in plant cells do we see an outer cell wall. Yes. We do not see an outer cell wall in animal cells. Now, we had actually just mentioned that bacteria have an outer cell wall that's made up of a polysaccharide. That's what we just said on the previous page. Well, plant cells also have an outer cell wall, and it's made up of a polysaccharide as well. And the name of that polysaccharide is cellulose. Cellulose. <clears throat> so that forms this. Now, you might say, is that written somewhere? Right down below. So right under at the bottom. Uh, plant cells have an outer rigid cell wall made up of a polysaccharide uh, called cellulose. Now, what else do plant cells have that animal cells, including human cells, lack? So there's a really large vacuole right here uh, uh, occupying most of uh, a plant cell. It's called the central vacuole. We'd already said a vacuole is a sac. But this really, really large sac is called the central vacuole. Animal cells don't have that. You can see in our model this large central vacuole right here. And as we wrote, uh, the purpose of that vacuole is to store uh, water, to store nutrients and waste products, Okay, water and minerals and so on. Uh, and the third structure that is uniquely found in plant cells and not in animal cells are these little green structures called chloroplasts. Now, in fact, the root chloral means green. That's what chloral means. And uh, what gives uh, the green color to the chloroplast structure is a green colored chemical called chlorophyll. You might say, wait a second, you're saying this awfully quickly. Is this written anywhere? It's on the next page, D3. So on page D3, we mentioned that the chloroplast contain this green colored chemical called chlorophyll. And uh, the pr process that is occurring uh, in the chloroplast is called photosynthesis. And so let's just uh, tell you what the photosynthesis reaction is. If you haven't, if you're in lecture and you haven't learned this yet, I guarantee you 100% probability, it's only a matter of time before your lecture teacher covers this and expects you to know it. So uh, <clears throat> photosynthesis is when uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, plant cell inside the chloroplast will take six molecules of CO2, that's carbon dioxide, and combine that with six molecules of water, H2O, using sunlight energy. After all, photosynthesis, anybody know what photo means? Photo means light. So it's using light energy. 
So light energy is used to join these carbon and oxygen and hydrogen atoms together to form C6H12O6. And C6H12O6 is glucose. That's a sugar called glucose. And in the process of the plant forming this sugar uh, that it use, uh, will use to make energy, uh, it also forms as a byproduct six molecules of oxygen, or O2. So that process, called photosynthesis, uh, uh, occurs in the chloroplast. And the purpose of the green-colored chemical, called chlorophyll, is that chlorophyll is, what it, is the chemical that absorbs that light energy. That's the purpose of chlorophyll, to absorb the light energy. All right, now, there is one unique structure that's found in animal cells, including human cells, that's not found in plant cells. It's called a centriole. And if you uh, look back here, uh, you can see that it points to something. It's hard to make out what exactly it is, but it's labeled a centriole. Centrioles are, are play a, a key role in cell division of animal cells, of the way animal cells, including human cells, divide. Okay, so now that we've now caught ourselves up with cells, so just here's what you uh, were supposed to have done last week, and whether you did it or successfully did it, you can do it again today. And uh, so we wanted you, uh, we asked you to work in groups of three, so we did, not everybody had to do this, but we said somebody should take a leaf, a small leaf from this aquatic plant that's commonly used in aquarium tanks, called an elodea or elodia. And we said just take a, a, a plain slide, not with anything on it, and uh, put some water on it. Take a the little leaf uh, and put the leaf on the in the water. The water keeps it alive, and then drop a cover slip over it. This is called a cover slip. And that cover slip, as we talked about when we do this, this is called a wet mount. We explained that last week uh, in the uh, information in exercise B. Uh, so when you drop that cover slip, that kind of creates like a little sandwich, a little sandwich, and keeps it all in place. And uh, sometimes we mentioned last week that when you do this so-called wet mount, is what it's known as, uh, you get air bubbles. Now, for anybody who's thinking, I don't know what you're talking about, a, a wet mount, you didn't explain that. Indeed, I did, and I'll just remind you the page where we talked about making a wet mount. It was page B13. So on page B13, we covered this last week. It said preparing a wet mount, and we mentioned that sometimes you get these air bubbles. So in fact, we covered exactly what a wet mount was. So that's page B13. So uh, we wanted you to look at this leaf, and just to remind you what you should have done, and if you didn't, you'll have an opportunity to do it today. I will be here the whole time, and then some today. Uh, so uh, we asked you to draw a picture of some of the uh, cells of the leaf under low power. And then uh, on the uh, next page, uh, D5, there were some questions. Among the questions, uh, and it should have looked something like this, incidentally, what you saw. And uh, we asked, are the cells green, or is the green color localized within the cells? It is localized. The only thing that's green about a plant cell are those little green ball-shaped things called chloroplasts. The, whole, the rest of the cell is not green. So what's really interesting is that even though you're looking at a leaf, and the leaf looks green, the leaf is, in fact, made up of small microscopic cells. And the only thing that's even green inside those cells are these little tiny ball-shaped things called chloroplasts that contain the green-colored chemical called chlorophyll that absorbs light energy. So uh, nevertheless, the very presence of that small amount of chlorophyll in those chloroplasts in the plant cells gives the entire leaf the appearance of being green. Uh, we, uh, asked you to find the cell wall and the central vacuole and the chloroplast, whether you're able to do that or not. We're going to try to help you do it again. If you didn't successfully do it last time, you'd say, how would I know if I did it successfully? I guess you would have drawn good pictures showing these things. If you didn't, we'll help you, and I will set up some demos of this as well. Did anybody happen to notice whether the chloroplasts were moving or not? Anybody see any moving? Yeah. Did it? Yes? Okay, so if they, if you saw them moving, that's called cyclosis. And today we'll try to see if we can 
find chloroplasts actually moving inside the plant cell. Now, on page D6, we asked you to do, draw it again, some of those same cells, but this time under high power, under high power magnification. Obviously, the cell should, should look larger. Now, there's, uh, and you don't have to draw every single cell that you see, just the two, three, four cells, so you get a general sense of what they look like. And you should draw them proportional to uh, the field of view, right? So if the, uh, in other words, if the cells look like they're about this big in this circular field, you don't draw a picture of a cell looking like, uh, instead of this, you don't draw it looking like this. Right? And you also don't draw it looking like that. All right? You try to draw it proportional to what it actually looks like. Uh, and the three main things, the three main things that you should have noticed, uh, or today will notice, is the rectangular shape of the cells, and of course, this outer uh, wall is called the cell wall, made up of cellulose. Uh, you uh, sh should definitely see the little green guys called chloroplasts where photosynthesis occurs. And then, in the center of the cell, it, uh, it kind of looks like it's empty. And the reason why it kind of looks empty is because that's where this large central vacuole is. So it's hard to make out the outline or the actual shape but basically it looks like it's empty or hollow in the center, and that's where this large vacuole containing water and minerals is located. Those are the three main things you should have noticed. Now, uh, after you've drawn your picture at high power, then, as we wrote on page D7, uh, you should then estimate the length and width of the cells using the method that we've already described, the same method you use to estimate the thickness of a hair or to have tried to do those ek, ek, answer the questions that we gave you last week to do for today. The very same method. Now, uh, then, uh, we asked you to try looking at onion. Again, not everybody has to do all these, but you should still look at one another's so you understand what these things are. Our basic question was this. Is an onion uh, 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 made up of cells? Yes. Well, for those of you who looked at it successfully, in fact, it is. Everything from a living thing is made up of cells. It's hard to believe, but it is. So uh, it, the, the, the hardest thing in terms of looking at the onion is to get a really small, thin piece. Sometimes people just take a big chunk of onion. What we want, in order to see these microscopic cells that are so small, you actually have to have a real thin, thin leaf, a real thin piece of onion. So you just kind of want to use your fingernail, as it were, and scrape off a very, very thin a piece of onion, not a big chunk. Anyhow, we do a wet mount. This is called a wet mount, where we put water to keep it, uh, uh, these onion cells alive. And so we've got water uh, and, and so on. And then uh, we wanted you on page uh, D8 to draw a picture and uh, under low power and uh, of what's, uh, what you saw. You should have seen onion cells. And they're actually pretty big. Uh, now, we, uh, so that's under low power. And on page uh, D9, we ask them questions. One of the questions we asked on D9 was, do the cells of the onion have chloroplasts or not? Did anybody see any green chloroplasts in the onion cells? Anybody? Were there green chloroplasts for anybody who looked at it? No, there aren't. There are no green chloroplasts. And that's why an onion doesn't look green. Because if it had green chloroplasts, didn't we say that since the cells that make up a leaf of a plant have green chloroplasts, the whole leaf looks green? Mm -hmm. So if an onion doesn't look green, it may be white, it may be brown, it may be purple, but it doesn't look green. I haven't seen a green onion. So therefore, there can't be any green chlorophyll in it. And if there's no chlorophyll, there's no chloroplasts. So then we asked, explain why. So. Huh? It doesn't use photosynthesis. It doesn't do photosynthesis. And let's figure out why it doesn't do photosynthesis. A leaf of a plant has chlorophyll in the chloroplast for photosynthesis. The onion that we eat is what part of a plant? Root. It's the root. It's, if you ever see it, how an onion grows, you've got to pull that thing up out of the ground, that onion bulb that we eat. 
So it, what good would it do to have chloroplasts with green chlorophyll? You can't do photosynthesis. There is no light under the earth. So in fact, no roots. There are no roots of any plants that look green because the roots never have chloroplasts, never contain chlorophyll, because they can't do photosynthesis when the root is under the ground. So that's why the onion doesn't look green. It's not designed for carrying on photosynthesis. So that's why. But it did have the rectangular shape in the cell wall. In fact, it should have looked like this. Yes. Kind of looked like that, if you saw it. If you did, you'll have a chance today. Now, uh, on page D10, then uh, we wanted you to uh, look at some cheek cells. So again, we urge you, when, and this is not only for this lab, but all future labs, you're supposed to actually read this. Anyhow, uh, so uh, you scrape the inside of your mouth, and gently, unless you want to look at blood cells as well, and then uh, take the stick, swirl it in some water that you've already placed on the covers, uh, on the glass slide, and then place a cover slip over it, on, uh, as it shows on D11. All right, and then what we wanted you to do first, as it says on the top of D11, uh, uh, again, we always tend to get some air bubbles, so don't confuse air bubbles with real cells. Remember, if it looks perfectly circular, it's an air bubble, because real cells are never that perfectly circular. Uh, and uh, we wanted you to uh, look at the cells and see, are your cheek cells pigmented? Do they have any color? And the answer is they're almost impossible to see. Before you put the dye on, you can't even see them. They're almost transparent. Uh, look, when you look inside your rau, it looks pink, right? Doesn't everybody look how your cheek is pink? The cells are almost transparent, the cheek cells. The only reason why they look pink is one of the few cells in a human that has color are red blood cells. And so you've got these microscopic uh, red blood cells flowing through microscopically small blood vessels called capillaries. And that creates a kind of reddish color to your entire inside of your body, including your mouth. The cheek cells themselves are transparent. Most cells in our body have no color. And that's why when you open somebody up, most everything looks pink because one of the only cells in our body that has any color are red blood cells, and they're called red blood cells because they really do look red. But most other cells in the body are transparent, so they have no color to them. Now, we also asked, are these epidermal cheek cells, do they move on their own? The answer is they do not move on their own. Now, if you shake the table, you know, then the water moves, and the cheek cells that are floating in the water appear to move around. But they cannot move on their own. We ask you the following question. Where would you want your cheek cells to go? They're not supposed to move around. Your cheek cells are supposed to stay right where they are in your cheek. Your brain cells are supposed to stay in your brain. Your liver cells are supposed to stay in your liver. So there's really uh, only uh, two human cells, two human cells that can exhibit independent movement. Anybody know what those are? You got one of them right, white blood cells. White blood cells can actually move. They're like the cops of the body, right? And so they can actually tr move anywhere they want through the body looking for suspicious characters called bacteria or viruses. So that white blood cells can move on their own. Now, not red blood cells. You'd say, wait a second. Red blood cells don't move on their own? Not on their own. A red blood cell cannot move. You'd say, wait a second. Aren't red blood cells flowing through the vessels? They are. They're being pushed. Red blood cells are being pumped or pushed through the vessels of our, your body by the blood pressure created by the pumping action of your heart. If your heart stops, do your red blood cells keep moving? No. No, they cannot move on their own. The only other human cell that can move on its own are, any other guesses? Human sperm. All right? So it's only human sperm. They can swim, they can move, and white blood cells. No other human cells can move on their own. Red blood cells are being pushed by the pumping action of the heart. They don't move on their own. In fact, there is a name that they give for when any other cells of your body start to move and start to go out of where they, they're supposed to be. So if, let's say liver cells start to move out of the liver or pancreas.
pancreas cells start to move out of the pancreas. What do they call that? Tumor. It is a type of tumor, but the term that you, everybody would know is cancer. Haven't you heard that cancer spreads? So any, what happens is if somebody has liver cancer, what that means is their liver cells have become cancerous. They actually start moving out of the liver and spreading all over the body, multiplying, and, and, uh, and so uh, that's, that's the definition of a cancer. The technical word is, of them spreading or moving is metastasizing. It's metastatic, all right? That means it's spreading. So liver cells are supposed to stay in the liver. They're not supposed to start moving out of the liver. Uh, lung cells are not supposed to move out of the lung. If they start moving out of the lung, you've got lung cancer. That's the definition of cancer. So all this stuff is relevant. Uh, all right, so you really have to use this blue dye, methylene blue, and just a tiny little bit. Commonly, students actually put too much, and everything looks so blue you can't see anything. So if that's, if that's what you found last week, so try doing it again, and just use a tiny, tiny bit, and then you just want to add a little bit of color, because these cheek cells, we said, are almost transparent, and give, adding a little color allows you to see them much, much better. What are they going to look like? When, when you try to see them before you've dyed them, they kind of just look like this, if you can make it out at all. And after you dye them, you can actually see the cell membrane, the nucleus. You might even see a nucleolus in the nucleus. So you'll try doing that. And then on page D12, we wanted you to draw a picture of some of the cheek cells under low power. And then on page D13, to draw them again under high power, and try to draw the cell relative to the size of the field of view. So again, if you're looking at a cell under high power, you don't just put a little dot. If it, if it looks bigger than that, you should make it proportional. And you don't just draw a big thing if it doesn't look that big, right? You want to try to draw it proportional. You don't have to be a perfect, it doesn't have to be perfect, you don't have to be an artist, but you're supposed to actually learn to look carefully, to be a, a careful observer and try to uh, represent, draw a representation of what you see. So that's under high power. And the three main things, or four main things you should see, is the cell membrane, the cytoplasm, uh, the nucleus, maybe you'll see a nucleolus, and the little dots that you see in the cytoplasm are little vacuoles or sacs. So those should be the main things you see. Uh, and then on page uh, D16, let's just look at these pictures. So on D16, uh, first, what it shows, I just turned this sideways. Uh, I just turned this sideways. What this is showing first is uh, way up here, it shows proportionate. This is drawn to scale. This shows a bacterium or prokaryotic cell, which we've talked about. Now, a virus, a virus is not a living cell. It's not a living thing. And you can see this viral particle is much smaller. It's just a fraction of the size of a bacterium. A bacterium is the smallest living cell. So there are things smaller than a bacterium, but they're not alive. <clears throat> and I talked about this in my lecture class. Commonly, students will say, well, wait a second. How could a virus not be alive? Don't viruses make you sick? So what? Is that the definition of something that's alive, that it makes you sick? I, I mentioned this in lecture. If you drank gasoline, wouldn't that make you sick? Does that mean gasoline's alive? That has nothing to do with the definition of a living thing. A living thing is something that can reproduce, that responds to its environment, that uh, grows in size. Viruses don't do any of that. So they're not living things. Now, you can see drawn here to scale, what it shows is both an animal cell and a plant cell. And what, the way this picture was done is that it shows a plant cell on this half and the structures, and it shows an animal cell on this half. So they're kind of similar. And you can see their relative size compared to a bacterial cell, which we said a bacterial cell is 1 100th one the size of like a human cheek cell. So they're very, very small. Uh, we will learn more about bacteria. Obviously, there are bacteria that do are parasites on us and cause bacterial diseases in us. Now, uh, we had mentioned that uh, even if you're a mouse or a human or a whale, ultimately you're still made up of cells. So uh, uh, even if you're a big organism, you're, you have organs, 
The organs are made up of tissues. The tissues are made up of cells. The cells are made up of cytoplasm or protoplasm, and inside the cytoplasm or protoplasm are little microscopic organelles. And these organelles ultimately are made up of organic molecules, like uh, carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins, and so on. 